So when you're looking for a technology that can capture CO2, you need something that has a high selectivity for carbon dioxide, that you can easily regenerate it. In other words, whatever you use to capture it can then release it so you can store it someplace. Got to be stable, low viscosity, and cheap. We always want everything to be cheap. And so what's currently being used is methanolamine. And this requires a lot of energy to capture CO2 using methanolamine, mono, monoethanolamine. It's corrosive, and it degrades at low temperatures. So it's not ideal, but it works. Um, so Joan Brennecke at Notre Dame has, um, she does a lot of research in ionic liquids. And so right now, they've got a, um, a lab scale unit going at Notre Dame to look at using ionic liquids to try to capture this. You know, we still don't know, but it's an interesting area of research. One could question the use of an ionic liquid with a nitrile group there. Um, it's one of the things, of course, we'll have to look at is the toxicity of this. But it shows some of the research that's going on to try to address this issue of how do you capture that carbon dioxide. And lastly, the last big challenge that was identified is sustainability education. And this is where I'm going to focus the rest of my talk. So education, I mean, as, as Vanya mentioned, um, because I'm um, in education at the American Chemical Society, this is a, a very important area for me. And, and I think it really is what will make a difference um, going forward uh, and into the future. So the challenge that this report identified in terms of sustainability education is the need, just like the, the UN decade for sustainability education I articulated, we need to improve science uh, uh, literacy in terms of sustainability at all levels. Okay, not just the scientists and engineers, but it, for everybody. And they identified three research areas. First is to offer professional development opportunities. One of the reasons teachers, faculty may not teach about sustainability it's because they've never been taught it themselves. And if we don't feel comfortable because we don't have the, the foundation or the knowledge on a topic, we tend to skip it. We're not going to talk about it. So we need to offer people, especially people who are already in the field, in the classroom, opportunities so they can get this understanding and learn how to integrate it into their teaching. Secondly, integrating sustainability concepts into assessments and accreditations if it's on the test, you're going to learn it. And then incorporating sustainability concepts into the curriculum. So I'm going to expand on all of these a little bit more um, so you can see some of the ideas and some of the areas in which people are working. So first of all, professional development. The wonderful conference we were just at is an excellent example of professional development. Because especially if you don't know a lot about green chemistry or sustainability, a very easy way to learn about it is to attend a conference where you can go to a lot of different talks in a very short time period in a lovely location. That also is wonderful. The falls were amazing. Um, for people who have the time and the interest, you can have longer opportunities like workshops. And the University of Oregon does a, an annual green chemistry and education workshop where they bring in faculty, organic chemistry faculty members who spend a whole week in the lab. They have a little bit of background introduction to green chemistry initially. And then they spend the rest of the time running green chemistry experiments. So then they're very comfortable with those experiments. And they take them back to their universities. And then they talk to the rest of the faculty. And they start to introduce these green chemistry labs. So it, it not only gives them sort of the tools they need to implement green chemistry laboratories themselves, but it also builds that community. Because then they've got, you know, it's like 25 or 30 faculty who are all in that workshop. They've got 25 or 30 new friends they can contact and say, hey, I tried this. This worked better on this lab that we did. Or have you thought about doing this? They can share labs that they're developing. So it starts to build a community, which is also going to be very helpful in advancing green chemistry and sustainability. Um, at professional meetings, um, organizing symposia on green chemistry, sustainability, education. Um, another, uh, you know, less concentrated in the workshop, but you get, you know, a half day or an entire day of presentations that, again, provide wonderful ideas. And then the summer schools. Um, in, I think back in 1999, the European Union began offering an annual summer school 
um, for students who were in the EU. So I shamelessly stole that idea and began offering in 2003 a summer school through the American Chemical Society. And this is the picture from this year's summer school. It's a summer school on green chemistry and sustainable energy. Um, we've moved around a bit. Um, we've actually had two in Latin America with funding from our National Science Foundation, uh, one in 2003 in Montevideo and one in 2007 in Mexico City. Um, a lot of our summer schools in the U.S. take place at the Colorado School of Mines. It is open to graduate students and postdocs from the U.S., Canada, and Latin America. Um, we tend to get a lot of applications from Argentina, but very few from Brazil. So I'm expecting, as a result of the Congress and, and my talk here, to get many more applications from Brazil for the summer school for next year. We don't have the dates yet, but we will very soon. And you know, Vanya, I'll, once I get the dates and we put our flyer together, I'll send that to you and you can share that with everybody because we want to have more students from Brazil at the summer school. <laughs> it is the most fun thing I do professionally every year. It's just wonderful. We have a really, we learn a lot, but we have a great time. Line dancing, <laughs> tour of the brewery, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so I encourage you to apply if you've got an interest in green chemistry and sustainability. Um, another aspect of professional development um, is preparing future teachers. Again, if, if as part of the preparation of future primary and secondary school teachers, they learn about sustainability and they learn about green chemistry, then they are likely to teach it themselves when they get into the classroom. One of the problems we have in the US is when we train teachers, here's the school of education, here's the chemistry department. They generally don't talk to each other. And that's not good because the chemistry department feels it's the responsibility of the school of education to train future teachers when it's both of their responsibilities. And so we are hoping, we've submitted a big proposal to NSF, that they will fund us to try to get chemistry departments working with colleges and schools of education to try to better prepare future teachers. We have to focus not just on the content, but how you teach it. What I'm doing now does not work with students from 5 to 18. Um, you've got to engage them in hands-on activities and group work and things like that. Um, and then we also need to encourage chemistry majors to become primary and secondary teachers. Uh, unfortunately, what often happens, and it's not just chemistry, we do a lot of work with our physicist friends, and um, too often if a good chemistry student or physics student goes into their, their faculty advisor and says, oh, I want to be a high school chemistry teacher, they discourage them. They say, oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're too good for that. You, you want to go to graduate school. Um, or you're never going to make enough money. Or you're just, you're just going to be frustrated all the time. It's, it's too hard to teach. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be sending good students into, into uh, primary and secondary education. And that's something we have to work on culturally. I don't know if it's the same here in Brazil. It is. Same thing. From talking to other people, it seems to be the same everywhere. We should be. When someone says, I want to be a high school chemistry teacher, we should say, that's wonderful. What can I do to help you instead of go to graduate school? Not that there's anything wrong with going to graduate school, because I realize many of you are in graduate school. But, but it is, um, it's not the only path, and there are many good pathways. OK, what about integrating sustainability and green chemistry concepts into accreditation and approval? One of the things that's really nice with the American Chemical Society is that we've had since 1936 an approval process for bachelor's degrees in chemistry. So we approve the chemistry departments themselves, and then the department chair can certify the graduates who have met all of the requirements. So that gives us some influence over chemistry departments. What we see now, this is about the only reference in the guidelines right now, that students should be aware of the role of chemistry in, in social and global issues. Um, the committee that's responsible for these guidelines is currently revising them, 
And so there is a movement among several groups to try to get stronger language about green chemistry and sustainability into the next round of guidelines, which would encourage departments to do so. ABET is the accrediting body in the United States for um, engineers. And they're, they're a little bit more forceful about this, um, understanding the impact in a global, economic, environmental, and societal uh, context. So again, it's another way to sort of encourage departments to incorporate sustainability topics into their curriculum and into their majors. The assessments, as I mentioned, if it's on the test, it's going to be taught. And so the ACS has an exams institute that produces standardized exams for general chemistry, for organic, and they're starting to incorporate a few green chemistry questions in there. Again, if it's on those assessments, faculty are going to start teaching them. Our college board is the test we were talking about getting into college here in Brazil. The US, the college board puts out the exams that people take to basically determine whether or not they're going to, or which school they're going to get into. It's not the only thing. There's other things, but that's part of it. If they start including questions on sustainability and green chemistry, then it will also get into the primary and secondary curriculum. And then we do not have a national curriculum in the United States. We have national science standards, but they're voluntary. So what does that mean? It means each one of our 50 states, plus the District of Columbia, have their own science standards, or it can go to the, state, uh, to the county level, to the city level. So it's just a mess. Um, it's just all over the place. Um, right now, they are developing new science standards, and more than half the states said they will adopt them. And there's a lot of environmental science in those. So I'm, I'm optimistic this, again, will help push this through the curriculum, through the primary and secondary grades. I think one of the biggest challenges is incorporating sustainability into the curriculum itself. One way to do it is, you know, if you're a faculty member conducting research, that can be part of your approach to your research. When you're working with students, you know, talking to them about, okay, here's the reaction we're going to do. Why don't you see if there, there are greener ways of carrying out this transformation? Um, looking at, do you really need to put it in the flask and let it stir overnight? You know, that requires energy. Can it be done in a shorter time period? So getting sort of that mindset. The curriculum, we need to get green chemistry and sustainability into the textbooks. Right now, it's in the textbooks, but usually it's a little sidebar or a box at the end of the chapter that everybody skips. It really needs to be integrated with examples as part of the text itself. It needs to get into the lab manuals. And there are some lab manuals available now, but that's been a little bit slow to move forward as well. Um, we need to do a better job connecting green chemistry with the broader sustainability concepts. I think right now we tend to just focus it as green chemistry and don't make that connection as to how can it help address some of the global challenges like food supply or global climate change or water quality. I mean, those are things that I think really help students understand better the importance of doing chemistry in the context of sustainability. Much of the educa or many of the educational resources right now are focused on organic. Organic's not the only chemistry course that people take. So we need to broaden out. We need more resources in general and analytical and inorganic chemistry. And we need, to, we need to incorporate green chemistry into outreach when we do things you know, at, at shopping malls or at schools, um, uh, science museums, sort of informal ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later.